Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's program, which will highlight antimicrobial stewardship and how it's improving transplant outcomes and the patient experience. Now, before we go ahead and get started, I'd like to take the next few minutes briefly reviewing our general housekeeping guidelines. When accessing our webinars, we highly recommend using the Chrome browser to ensure an optimal visual and audio experience. If you're already using Chrome and experience any audio issues, we do recommend reconnecting to the webinar using the phone number that was provided in your confirmation email. Additionally, throughout the duration of today's presentation, your audio lines will remain muted so that we can ensure the best audio quality for our speakers. That being said, we do ask that you take note of the chat feature that's located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. This chat will be used to pose your questions to our presenters during the Q&A discussion. So if you have any questions that come up during the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time. Once the presentation has concluded, we'll go ahead and transition into our Q&A discussion where our presenters will address as many of your questions as time allows. Now for anyone interested in our upcoming webinars, please note registration is currently open for our next Get Connected webinar, which will focus on the ABCs of DCDD, the legal aspects of pursuing an authorized donor in DCD cases. Now please note this webinar is currently in the process of being rescheduled for a later date due to speaker availability. So please stay tuned for that new date. In the meantime, registration is also open for our next transplant webinar which will highlight life after regions. That's coming your way on June 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern. For more information on all of our upcoming webinars and to ensure you have the latest information, please visit our website at organdonationalliance.org. Now, for those of you seeking continuing education credits, we are offering one SEPSI credit and one nursing contact hour for this webinar. As always, a certificate of attendance will also be available for those of you who are seeking CEs that may not be available. Everyone joining us today is eligible to claim either of these credits or certificates. Prior to receiving your certificate, you will be asked to complete a brief online evaluation that will allow you the opportunity to provide us with your valuable feedback. If you're listening in a group, please be sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. As a friendly reminder, you'll have 30 calendar days to complete your evaluations and claim your credits. Now, without further ado, I'd like to begin today's program by introducing our moderator, Betty Crandall, retired transplant administrator and member of the Alliance's webinar faculty. Betty, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today, and at this point I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce both of our presenters. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening in. I think you'll find this program very interesting and informative for you. We have two speakers. Um, the first speaker is Stephanie Pouch. Dr. Pouch received her medical degree from Temple University School of Medicine in 2007. She completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at the University of Chicago, served as chief resident at the John Stroger Junior Hospital of Cook County and completed fellowship training in infectious diseases at Columbia University Medical Center. While in Columbia, Dr. Pouch obtained a Master of Science in Biostatistics at the Mailman School of Public Health. She joined the faculty at Emory University as an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases in 2017. Dr. Pouch's clinical and research interests relate to infectious complications of solid organ and stem cell transplantation with a primary research emphasis on multidrug resistant gram-negative infections in transplant recipients. She is an active member of the American Society of Transplantation where she serves as past chair of the Infectious Disease Community of Practices Multidrug Resistant Organisms Work Group as well as the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation and the Transplantation Society. I would also like to congratulate her on recently becoming a 2020 inductee as a fellow of the American Society of Transplantation. Our second speaker is Miranda So. Dr. Miranda So is a pharmacothe pharmacotherapy specialist at the Sinai Health System University Health Network Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. She is an assistant professor at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto, where she received her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy and Doctor of Pharmacy or PharmD degree. From 2012 to 2018, she was the founding faculty coordinator of the year three elective Introduction to Mic 
antimicrobial stewardship in the PharmD program. Her main clinical and research interests are antimicrobial stewardship in immunocompromised patients. She has been an invited speaker at many local, national, and international infectious disease and pharmacy conferences. Miranda has been a recipient of several local and national research grants. She is also the chair of the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists Foundation Education Grant Committee. She is an active member of the American Society of Transplantation and the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. Miranda is currently pursuing a Master's of Public Health degree at the Harvard School of Public Health. In her spare time, I don't know where she finds that, she loves to run, knit, and is equally happy to talk a good yarn as she would with antibiotics. I'd like to welcome both our speakers and turn the program over. Uh, Stephanie, I think, is going to begin our presentation. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Stephanie Pouch, and I will begin um, the first portion of the webinar today. Uh, but before I get started, I just wanted to um, thank, the, uh, thank the committee for inviting us to speak today about a topic that is certainly very near and dear to our hearts, and that is antimicrobial stewardship um, in solid organ transplant recipients. Neither Dr. So nor I have any financial disclosures relevant to this presentation, uh, nor will we discuss any off-label or investigational use of drugs or devices. We have three main objectives uh, for this webinar today. The first is to define antimicrobial stewardship and discuss the need for antimicrobial stewardship in solid organ transplant programs. The second is to describe the infrastructure of solid organ transplant-centered stewardship programs. And lastly, to describe the components of an effective solid organ transplant-centered antimicrobial stewardship program. Now, before we uh, jump into the presentation, we just thought we would um, poll the audience. Um, we were interested in uh, getting your responses to the following question, um, which is the, basically, what is the primary goal of antimicrobial stewardship programs? Um, is it to decrease costs? decrease antimicrobial use, increase antimicrobial appropriateness, and improve or improve patient safety and outcomes. I think everyone has access to the poll right now, um, and so we'll just give everyone a minute to respond, um, keeping in mind that there are no you know, necessarily right or wrong answers. Um, and we're just kind of interested in, in the group's perception of stewardship programs in general. It looks like we've got oh, almost 20 responses. Give it another few seconds. Okay, I'm going to uh, go ahead and close the poll. Oops. Okay, and. Um, Oh, wow. Okay, so it looks like the majority of the audience, it looks like about over uh, three quarters, if I'm reading things correctly, yeah, say that the, the primary goal of stewardship programs is to improve patient safety and outcomes. Fantastic. All right. So um, I just thought I'd begin by defining antimicrobial stewardship. Based on a consensus statement from multiple organizations, which include the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society, antimicrobial stewardship is defined as coordinated interventions designed both to improve and measure the appropriate use of antibiotic agents by promoting the selection of the optimal drug regimen. Factors considered when delineating an optimal regimen include the choice of the agent itself, based on culture data, site of infection, allergy history, and multiple other factors, dose of the antibiotic, considering issues such as site of infection and renal or hepatic impairment, route of administration, most commonly either oral or IV, as well as duration of therapy. 
the benefits of antimicrobial stewardship are multiple and include, but are certainly not limited to, minimization of adverse effects, including C. difficile infection, colonization and infection with multidrug resistant organisms, or MDROs, and adverse drug events, as well as improved antibiotic susceptibilities to targeted antimicrobials. And overall, these benefits lead to improved patient outcomes. Now, keeping in mind this goal of improved outcomes as well as um, an optimized patient experience, I wanted to first discuss why antimicrobial stewardship is so imperative in solid organ transplantation. We all know that solid organ transplant recipients are at increased risk of infection due to immunosuppression. But this risk is certainly dynamic and impacted by a number of variables, including time from transplant, graft dysfunction, intensity of immunosuppression, and history of previous exposures, as highlighted in the figure. In addition, we also need to consider the organ transplanted. Liver and lung transplant candidates, for example, may be colonized with MDROs prior to transplant due to longstanding antibiotic exposures. And we see this commonly in the setting of patients with cirrhosis requiring spontaneous bacterial peritonitis prophylaxis, as well as in patients with underlying cystic fibrosis, among other conditions. Now, I wanted to uh, develop further this, this um, concept of antibiotic use in MDROs um, and highlight why this is particularly salient for the transplant population. Now, in general, antibiotic use drives antimicrobial resistance and the odds of developing an MDRO in an antibiotic exposed patient is anywhere between about two to five times that of patients who are not receiving an antibiotic. In addition, we know that about half of hospitalized patients and 75% of critically ill patients receive an antibiotic during their hospitalization. But on review of these prescriptions, about half of them are considered inappropriate. And when we start to look at MDROs and solid organ transplant recipients, we have seen, based on a number of studies, that these pathogens are a real threat to patient and graft survival. Not only is solid organ transplantation an independent uh, risk factor for MDRO acquisition, but we also know that our, our transplant recipients are at risk due to poor functional status, prolonged hospitalization, and the frequent and often uh, protracted use of broad-spectrum antimic antimicrobials. In addition, management of MDROs in, in solid organ transplant recipients is complicated by a number of factors, including drug-drug interactions and additive toxicities, considering, for example, the use of um, an aminoglycoside in a kidney transplant recipient on tacrolimus who may not have um, you know, ideal renal function, so to speak. In addition, we all know that management of MDROs is also limited by um, the anti a relatively dry antimicrobial pipeline which again highlights why stewardship is so important. I just wanted to run through a couple of examples to highlight, um, to highlight the, the reason why we need to be so concerned about antibiotic use and resistance in transplant recipients. And I'm going to start by using the example of vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE. We know that there is a uh, high prevalence of VRE in liver transplant recipients, and in fact, um, the colonization rates in liver transplant recipients range from about 12 to 32 percent in the literature. We know that colonization is associated not only with uh, subsequent VRE infection, as shown on the graph on the left, but has also been associated with um, mortality, as shown in the figure on the right. In addition, another study has highlighted that VRE bacteremia is associated with decreased one-year survival after liver transplant, as well as a 30-day mortality exceeding 30%. Now, the challenge with all of this is that knowledge of VRE colonization, um, albeit concerning, often drives anti-VRE therapy. Um, and so a lot of individuals will be placed empirically on agents such as daptomycin. Now, this has led to increasing concern over the past few years about daptomy daptomycin non-susceptible VRE, or DNSE for short, uh, particularly in relation to liver transplantation. So there was an, an initial single center uh, review of DNSE in liver transplant recipients um, published a few years ago. And that one transplant center happened to have noticed an uptick in their DNSE rates in liver transplant recipients around 2013 to 2014. 
And among these liver transplant recipients, about 50% were had been colonized with VRE previously, um, and it had long and complicated hospital courses, um, particularly uh, complicated by bleeding and need for renal replacement therapy. Now, unfortunately, since uh, there were only 14 patients um, analyzed in the study, the authors really couldn't tell whether previous daptomycin exposure may have been a risk factor for their subsequent DNSE infection. However, a more recent retrospective multicenter study of bacteremic liver transplant recipients did in fact show that previous daptomycin use is associated with DNSE bacteremia and that DNSE bacteremia is associated with death censored allograft failure. Another uh, group of pathogens that I think are highly concerning in solid organ transplantation are the carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, or CRE. Um, and and carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella pneumonia is particularly uh, problematic. Globally, the incidence of post-transplant uh, carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, or CRKP, infection varies by center and type of organ transplant. However, CRKP infections tend to occur early after transplant, with most, most studies reporting a median time of less than 50 days from transplant to infection. Concerningly, mortality rates among solid organ transplant recipients with CRE infection have generally ranged from 30 to 50 percent, and post-transplant CRKP infections have been associated with as much as a tenfold risk of death. And again, we see that previous antibiotic exposure is a consideration when we think about the epidemiology of CRE. Um, in a recently published meta-analysis, um, we see that carbapenem and cephalosporin exposures are the most commonly implicated antibiotic risk failures for CRE infection. Um, and interestingly, the use of glycopeptides, um, like vancomycin, was also considered an increased, uh, was, was associated with an increased risk of CRE acquisition. Um, and again, I think this all highlights um, the, the indication to have, uh, to pay close attention to antibiotic use and does um, help make the case for stewardship in solid organ transplantation. And it is important to keep in mind that resistance issues are not limited to bacteria. We certainly see um, antiviral resistance, particularly in relation to CMV, um, where we oftentimes grapple with gancyclovir-resistant disease. And we are seeing resistance to newer agents, including latermavir. In addition, um, there has been emergence of um, azole-resistant aspergillus species and other uh, resistant fungal infections in transplant recipients who have had previous antifungal exposures. And finally, we'd be remiss um, not to mention COVID-19 um, in the talk today, unfortunately. Um, I think, you know, that with COVID-19, we're seeing um, a, a substantial amount of morbidity and mortality related to this infection, both in solid organ transplant recipients and in, in the population in general. Um, and we know that um, there is a lot of broad-spectrum antibiotic use in um, critically ill patients hospitalized with COVID-19. In fact, one um, report from the Chinese epicenter noted that over 95% of patients admitted with COVID-19 received broad-spectrum antibiotic use. And while that you know, may certainly be appropriate um, early on during the hospital stay pending additional workup, I think this highlights the, need, highlights the importance of stewardship even right now in the current pandemic. And I just wanted to mention a few additional reasons why I think stewardship is so important outside the concept of antimicrobial resistance alone. Um, as we know, antibiotic use is associated with C. diff infection or CDI. And CDI is in fact a leading cause of infectious diarrhea in solid organ transplant recipients. And I think we all struggle with uh, management of CDI in transplant recipients, and it can become really challenging, especially when patients present with recurrent disease. Um, but we're also seeing other downstream effects of CDI in transplantation, um, as highlighted in this study and the next. Um, the, in, a, in a recent study that was published actually in 2018, the Swiss transplant cohort study showed that among individuals with uh, CDI, um, or transplant patients, I should say, with CDI, um, the risk of graft loss was higher uh, than it was for solid organ transplant recipients who did not um, have CDI. And this included even mild or moderate disease. 
Another study addressed the impact of early and late CDI after transplant on mortality and transplant organ complication-related infections. And uh, just for nomenclature purposes, they defined early CDI as onset within 90 days of transplant and late CDI greater than 90 days after transplant. And for all of those patients who survived more than 90 days post-transplant, um, we see that for both individuals with early and late CDI, um, survival was uh, lower than it was for individuals without CDI, as you can see on the figure on the left. In addition, individuals with CDI both early and late had an increased risk for transplant organ complication-related hospitalizations. Now, neither study um, clearly uh, um, proved causality, but I think these studies do highlight um, the need to be um, vigilant about CDI to um, improve stewardship interventions uh, targeted at minimizing the risk of CDI and, and the need for improved management strategies for this infection in our transplant recipients. And lastly, um, I thought I would just mention the gut microbiome, which is kind of a hot topic in research right now. We know that transplantation disrupts the composition of commensal microbial flora through a number of mechanisms, including immunosuppression, the surgical procedure itself, as well as infection and antibiotic exposure, both for prophylaxis and therapy. And so this disruption of the host's microbiome uh, leading to dysbiosis has been associated with the development of chronic rejection, um, ischemia reperfusion injury, and subsequent infection. And so we need to see a lot more research in this area, but I think it's, again, another reason to be very cognizant of antibiotic use in our population. And so for a lot of the reasons that I had previously highlighted, there's been um, a significant and growing interest in developing antimicrobial stewardship programs targeted to the solid organ transplant population. And the initial call for transplant stewardship happened in 2013 after uh, that year's um, set of, of American Society of Transplantation ID guidelines were published. Um, and those guidelines actually didn't mention stewardship in transplant patients at all. And so the authors of this letter to the editor argued that while transplant recipients likely derive downstream effects of stewardship programs as a whole, that we really need to systematically study antimicrobial stewardship in transplant patients and uh, move towards implementing these programs more regularly. And so with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. So to talk about infrastructure. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pouch. That was very good foundational and very good analysis of the, um, the need for antimicrobial stewardship. So I'm going to move on to talk more about infrastructure of antimicrobial stewardship programs, specifically for solid organ transplants. So I subtitled it, you know, what can we borrow and what can we steal? Now, we're not going to beg. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So just bear with me and you understand why I have this subtitle. So uh, maybe we'll start with the Joint Commission as, you know, one of the major and world-renowned accrediting organizations. Um, in 2017, the Joint Commission approved antimicrobial stewardship as a new standard for hospitals. And with this year, 2020, um, it's expanded to include ambulatory care settings. And they specifically identified this as an organizational priority. Now, I'm not going to read all the requirements and the rationale, but as you could see, this completely echo what Dr. Pouch has laid out before in terms of why we need this to help protect our patients. So that's kind of one of the most, um, you know, um, resounding support uh, from, you know, a standard setting organization's perspective uh, for antimicrobial stewardship. The second one I want to highlight is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So this came into effect also in 2020. And the requirements here focus on reducing uh, development and transmission of hospital-acquired infections and antibiotic-resistant organisms, with the ultimate goal to improve the care and safety of patients while looking at cost benefits for the hospitals. So there is like a twofold benefit here that they've highlighted. We want patients to do better. We also want the financial side to do better as well. Again, 
echoing everything Dr. Pouch has previously mentioned in the slides. I also want to note that they specifically said you don't just have a program not in name only. They're looking for active interventions as well as hospital-wide implementation. They also talk about optimization of antibiotic use um, and also following nationally recognized guidelines. So I think this was, again, a very remarkable and resounding support for antimicrobial stewardship. Then I want to turn towards the CDC, um, core elements for antimicrobial stewardship programs. This was uh, from 2019. Um, I want to highlight this because on the right side of the panel, you can see there's a map and it talks about nationally, just under 85% of hospitals um, in the US have met the seven core elements, which are on the left side of the screen. Um, the national goal is to accomplish 100% by this year. So we'll see with the COVIDization of everything, we'll see if that goal can be attained. But I think it is worthwhile to talk about these seven core elements. So the first one is hospital leadership commitment. Second, accountability. Three is pharmacy expertise and leadership. Four is action implementation of interventions. So these are the best practices recommendations. Five is tracking, six reporting, and seven is education. Um, I'll go into a little bit uh, for each of these in the next few slides. So I'll kind of define the first three as the who within the core element. It talks about hospital leadership. So I think this is a very important, if you think about antimicrobial stewardship as a quality improvement initiative, you will always need to have backing from the institution's administration. They're also responsible to help you with resource allocation and support troubleshooting. Um, if, if you know, there's particular difficulties, you turn to them and they give you advice and actual support um, as well. So that's important. But comes with that is number two, which is accountability. Um, this core element emphasizes emphasizes there to be reporting structure to the hospital administration with identifiable person or persons responsible for the antimicrobial stewardship program. And with that, there's also recommended membership of the team, which should be interprofessional and multidisciplinary. And as we go into the next few slides, I'll talk about why this is important uh, from the perspective of a solid organ transplant population. The other piece with the accountability is the key stakeholders. We need to identify who they are and show that we're accountable to them in whatever interventions that we implement. And this goes for a general antimicrobial stewardship program, but it's equally necessary for a solid organ transplant focused stewardship program. Core, ele core element number three under the WHO is pharmacy expertise and co-leadership. The so previous version of the core element didn't give this highlight, and I think it's very helpful to specify that pharmacy expertise specific to antibiotic use, as well as having pharmacists as co-leader of the program is important. Again, coming back to the theme of um, um, membership of the team, being interprofessional, et cetera, uh, I think this is very helpful. So this is the part where I think, well, what can we borrow or steal for the um, solid organ transplant focused stewardship program? So in the middle of this slide, you have kind of the different bubbles. These are the different um, um, members um, and also stakeholders. So definitely um, the patient and the caregiver in the middle because we want what we do to be patient focused, patient centered. And then of course, we would have local champions. We cannot do anything without the support of local champions. So I think in this case, for a transplant-specific uh, stewardship program, it could be the transplant surgeons, transplant physicians, uh, program directors, and program coordinators. Uh, we want to solicit their support in order to make the stewardship initiative a success. The other pieces would be the prescribers. So it could be advanced practice uh, clinicians or physicians, Anyone who has any uh, 
any active role in prescribing um, and treating um, uh, infections. Um, the other piece would be, of course, the nurse. In fact, there is actually a highlight in the nurse's role in the um, interdisciplinary, sorry, um, interprofessional and multidisciplinary nature of the stewardship team in the current CDC recommendation. Because we know the nurse is at the bedside interacting with the patient as well as family members and loved ones. So they're kind of the most, um, uh, the most direct input would be very helpful in understanding uh, antimicrobial use. The other piece would be the uh, transplant team pharmacist. I often collaborate closely with the transplant team pharmacist, especially in managing things like drug-drug interactions, um, and also accessibility of medications for the patients. So these are things that I always work with them in my role as the transplant stewardship pharmacist. In any stewardship program, microbiologists cannot be without, so we always include them. And sometimes there might be transplant-specific data that you want to work with your microbiologist to obtain. The other piece here would be the stewardship pharmacist and the um, stewardship um, and infectious disease physician. Um, in a survey that we conducted in the summer of 2018 of uh, members of the American Society of Transplantation, respondents to the survey felt that they do want the stewardship team to have specialized knowledge with respect to transplant patients. And I think that strengthens the face validity of their recommendations. And I think that's a, a kind of a good thing to, to keep in mind. So with this, of course, we need the administrator of the organization to support us. And again, coming back to uh, hospital leadership support and the accountability. So I just want to highlight once again, what we need here is we have existing program membership and program infrastructure. We do want to have some add-ons here to make it specific and tailored for uh, transplant programs. So um, the core elements 427 are the, um, the what and the how, in my opinion. So uh, number four is the implementation of stewardship interventions. Some of these might be familiar to the uh, members of the audience because you might have come across them kind of in the general population. Um, audit and feedback is um, one form of uh, intervention, as in we actively discuss with the prescriber um, you know, advice on um, antimicrobial use. Um, there are different forms of how this could be done. Um, some institution would have um, restriction policy, so you require a pre-approval process to prescribe um, a certain list of antimicrobials. Other institutions have post-prescription review, so it's more of a discussion, a collaborative approach in um, kind of advising how we move forward with the management of the patient. Um, and then with the COVID situation, I could tell you at my institution, we've actually moved to um, um, electronic, sorry, not electronic, virtual um, audit and feedback, as in we meet through either, you know, Microsoft Teams or some secure channel that we discuss patients, but we carry on with our audit and feedback rounds. We don't, we don't stop just because we're not allowed, because we have to do physical distancing. The other piece is guidelines. So the CDC core elements talk a lot about, you know, having local guidelines, facility-specific guidelines. This is important because it's great to have published guidelines, but not everything would be applicable to your institution, your patient population, your local epidemiology. So it's important to have local elements uh, that could be uh, used uh, to help guide antimicrobial prescribing. Again, remember I talk about you want to include a microbiologist as your stewardship program. Um, this is where they'll be offering a lot of help. The next piece is the dose optimization, IV to PO switch. So these are things that are a lot of times functions of uh, pharmacist advice. Um, again, it's important to have an interprofessional team. Durational therapy is a little bit more tricky because not everything in transplant population, uh, we have the most solid evidence in terms of defining the duration to treat a certain infection. 
So these are things that probably would be a window for future research opportunity. Tailoring of antibiotics also kind of fall into that category. Sometimes prescribers might want to keep things broad spectrum. And so again, that requires some collaborative approach and uh, discussion. The labeling of penicillin allergy is a very hot topic right now in the general antimicrobial stewardship sense. For immunocompromised patients, there are actually a fair amount of information in the hematology oncology patients. In solid organ transplant, probably a little bit behind, but I'm hoping we'll see more information. This speaks to kind of reclassifying or re-educating the patient about the self-reported penicillin allergy. Perhaps it wasn't a true allergy. We're not denying their experience, but we want them to understand what they had was not necessarily allergy. It could be an adverse event, for example. Now, element number five and six are important quality improvement elements. So tracking, we want to talk about how much antibiotics are being used and how well they're being used. Number six is reporting. So I kind of call it sharing is caring. If we don't know how we do, we can't improve. And so five and six should go together. And this is, uh, this is very important. Whatever you are transparently uh, tracking, you should transparently sharing with all the stakeholders. And number seven is education, similar to what we're doing at this moment. So in terms of the tracking and the sharing, so uh, what's in existence is, uh, one of them is the CDC National Healthcare Safety Network, so NHSN. They have the AMU, AMR module. So AMU is antimicrobial use. Antimicrobial resistance is AMR. So what this does is launched, it was uh, an initiative that's launched uh, nationally. Participating hospitals have to meet certain technological requirements so that they could upload their information. What they get in return is a report that tells them um, how they're using, how much antimicrobial they're using, normalized to their patient volume, and allows them to uh, compare as internal comparison as well as external benchmarking with peer hospitals. So it, it reports um, a standardized antimicrobial administration ratio for specific antibiotics. So if you know that, oh, why am I using 20% more antimicrobials or a certain antibiotic compared to a peer hospital, this is how you might want to think about, well, maybe I should look more into how this drug is being used, how this particular antibiotic is being used. Um, for the AMR module, it gives you the organism and antibiotic specific resistance rate. So these, the reason I think they're applicable to solid organ transplant patient is because um, it allows peer hospital comparison. It allows patient population comparison. Um, so if you select a particular unit that you want to trace um, over a period of time for internal comparison, this would allow you to do that. I think one caveat is that it doesn't give you the quality of the antimicrobial use, as in the appropriateness. However, like I said, if you look at your report and you're using 20% more compared to a peer hospital with similar case mix as your hospital, that might spur on further investigation and uh, uh, deeper dive into you know, the quality of the um, antimicrobial use. And again, this kind of comes back to the patient safety metrics related to healthcare-associated uh, infections. So the other piece that we could also borrow is um, in existence would be the um, National Surgical, Surgical Quality Improvement Program um, and the NISQIP. Um, and then there's actually a spin-off called the TRANSQIP, which is the Transplant Specific Quality Initiative um, um, Project. And this focuses on transplant-related healthcare-associated infections. Um, and again, it should go on a deeper dive into kind of the appropriateness of antibiotic use. So this is an extension of an existing program. So I want to take a, a slightly more international look at uh, what's out there outside of North America. So this is from Australia. Uh, it's the Australia's National Center for Antimicrobial Stewardship. So they have a web-based tool called the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey, or as we you know, kind of uh, 
uh, and nickname it is the NAPS, the NAPS. So this is a web-based tool. Um, the reason it is adaptable to transplant patients is because you can do it specific to the unit. So on the right side of the screen, this is actually our hospital's data. Um, this is specific to the multi-organ transplant units um, that was done. It's a point preference survey that we did um, last year. And it gives you um, kind of an at a glance, almost like a dashboard of uh, compliance with our local specific uh, transplant specific guidelines. And it gives you kind of a dashboard of, you know, how appropriate was the antimicrobial prescribing patterns. Um, so what this does is allowing the clinician to collect patients' clinical data, um, antibiotic prescription data, and adjudicate them in real time for appropriateness, either against uh, local or published guidelines, um, or antimicrobial stewardship principles, which Dr. Pouch had alluded to earlier. And this is actually um, a very interesting web tool, and I think the fact that it gives you a real-time assessment, uh, you could do it longitudinally, you could do it once a month, you could do it once a year. This also helps to kind of present the information to the stakeholders in a very appealing fashion. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Pouch to talk about the best practices. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, so I think it's really worth mentioning that despite very compelling reasons to utilize antimicrobials judiciously, it is very challenging to implement stewardship programs in the solid organ transplant population. And this is for a number of reasons, including diagnostic uncertainty in transplant patients, and that's in part due to atypical presentations with common illnesses, presentation with atypical pathogens, um, and, and a frequent need to actually obtain tissue in order to make uh, diagnoses. As I noted earlier, um, transplant patients are very frequently colonized with MDROs, which does impact our empiric antibiotic use. In addition, there are challenges with obtaining source control in transplant recipients. There's, um, an in there's a perception that transplant patients are um, automatically presenting with more severe infection than their non-immunosuppressed counterparts who may present with the same syndrome. And finally, there's a lack of guidelines that specifically delineate optimal length of therapy in the transplant population. But, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, any challenge comes opportunity. And I think in order to understand where opportunities for stewardship lie, we really need to understand how our colleagues view stewardship. And so um, Dr. So and colleagues actually um, uh, uh, released a 23-question survey to members of the American Society of Transplantation back in 2018 in an attempt to assess perceptions and attitudes of transplant clinicians towards antimicrobial resistance and stewardship in the transplant population. In total, there were 308 respondents, which reflected just shy of 10% of the AST membership um, and the largest numbers of respondents were ID physicians followed by transplant physicians. 66% felt that the main goal of antimicrobial stewardship programs was to increase the appropriateness of antimicrobials. And over 40% uh, did agree that, that they had seen um, antibiotic resistant infections in their patient population. The majority of ID and non-ID clinicians did consider stewardship programs to have a positive impact on the quality of patient care. And I think very interestingly, the vast majority, so 92% of non-ID respondents, said that they would be more likely to follow stewardship recommendations if transplant ID was actually part of the stewardship team. So is transplant ID involvement um, the, the big solution to stewardship. Um, and I'm again going to highlight another uh, study by my, by my colleague, Dr. So. Um, so she and her colleagues um, performed 176 audits on antimicrobial therapy in transplant patients and uh, assessed antibiotic regimens against stewardship principles that have been established by the CDC and transplant guidelines where appropriate. And overall, 70% uh, of prescriptions were stewardship concordant, um, but the most common stewardship concord, disconcord, uh, sorry, discordant categories were lack of de-escalation of therapy, 
um, overly broad empiric antibiotic therapy, as well as prolonged durations. Now, interestingly, Transplant ID was consulted on 54% of prescriptions, um, and they did find that Transplant ID consults were associated with a higher percentage of stewardship concordant prescriptions, but as you can see, it's still not perfect. And interestingly, um, among the 12 Transplant ID consulted stewardship discordant audits, eight were attributed to non-adherence to Transplant ID recommendations. So why does this happen? And I think the answer lies in, um, our, in, in the culture of medicine. So we know that there's a limited amount of qualitative research that describes specialty-specific prescribing patterns. And there have been a small number of studies, including the one I've referenced here, which have examined antibiotic Sorry, prescribing through an anthropologic or ethnographic lens. And so we've learned that aspects of culture unique to each specialty, including the rounding environment, so does the group round with an attending versus rounding separately from an attending, timing and frequency of handoffs, as well as team hierarchy. All of these factors do seem to correlate with behaviors and, and psychology related to antibiotic use. And so, how do, we, how do we leverage these differences to really help our patients? And I think this may all begin with a handshake, or in the, in the current era, perhaps either a wave or, or via Zoom. Um, but I did want to mention this concept of handshake stewardship. Um, and, and in handshake stewardship, um, a pharmacist and physician who are members of the stewardship team actually perform in-person rounding with the inpatient teams. And so rather than restricting antibiotics, um, antibiotic decision-making is made collaboratively. And in programs that have implemented handshake stewardship, there have been reductions in antibiotic use, particularly antibiotic use that would have otherwise been considered inappropriate. And my, in my opinion, you know, additional benefits of, of handshake stewardship are that we better understand the culture of antibiotic prescribing among the different specialties. And I think, you know, it really enforces the shared goal of positive patient outcomes and a team-based team-based approach to patient care. Now, um, you know, handshake stewardship is certainly labor and resource intensive, and depending on um, the infrastructure of uh, your program, this, this may not be feasible. Um, but I think the key is to, to keep in mind that stewardship does not equate with ID, but rather team involvement is pivotal. And so we really need to involve um, infectious disease, stewardship, and all of the physicians, surgeons, pharmacists, nurses, and all other members of the transplant care team. And again, keep in mind that we all are working together towards a common goal, and we all have shared interests. I just wanted to briefly mention um, the role of hospital epidemiology and infection prevention and control in the stewardship model. I think it's important to keep in mind that hospital, hospital epidemiologists can support stewardship programs by sharing surveillance data, helping to bridge gaps between stewardship programs and other uh, departments and divisions in the hospital, integrate educational programs with stewardship, um, and share outbreak alerts among, you know, other benefits of having, um, having epidemiology involved. And finally, I'd be remiss not to mention the microbiology lab. And I think engagement of the transplant team with microbiology is really pivotal. And this is important for a number of reasons, including reduction in time to effective antibiotic therapy. Um, in, inadequate antimicrobial um, therapy is prescribed in more than half of transplant recipients hospitalized with infections and ultimately results in about a three-and-a-half-fold increase in mortality compared to those receiving appropriate therapy. So how do we ensure that patients are on effective therapy sooner? Um, I think one potential benefit would be collaboration with the microbiology lab to develop transplant-specific antibiograms. So hospitals in general will produce anti antibiograms, which are periodic summary reports of susceptibility patterns. And if we look at hospital-wide antibiograms alone, we really may not see differences in susceptibility data across populations. And in the figure on the left, you see some data um, published a few years ago that actually showed susceptibilities for E. coli isolates were much lower in transplant recipients than they were in the general hospitalized population. And finally, the microbiology lab um, can provide assistance with respect to rapid diagnostics. We've been seeing a lot more interest in things such as multiplex PCR panels, which can rapidly detect organisms from blood, GI, and respiratory 
uh, specimens and, and provide quick turnaround time with respect to organism identification and genotypic resistance information. And so these panels and other rapid diagnostics may have a role in transplant stewardship, but we certainly need to uh, continue to study these as we move forward. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this one piece. I kind of going along with the theme of, you know, what can we borrow, what can we steal? We're not going to beg, but we're going to ask. So the, you know, the topic here is, you know, what would you be asking the C-suite, quote unquote, to support an antimicrobial stewardship specific to the transplant patients in your, in your institution? I think the first part is understand what is already available at your center, your institution, what resources can be leveraged. And hopefully in um, kind of section two, I highlighted what's there and what would be the added pieces that you would want to request. I think it's important to support your ask with transplant specific data. And so what Dr. Pouch mentioned with respect to um, resistance rate in the transplant population, uh, maybe obtaining antibiotic use data specific to transplant population. I talked about that in section two. So these are things that you want to support, uh, you want to use to support your ask to the C-suite. I think, you know, as with all situations, you know, always think about, well, what's in it for them? What would it kind of turn the table around it? put yourself in their shoes and think, well, what would it be, you know, helpful to know in order to support this request, right? We want to make them look good. So how can we do that? I think one piece, very important, is the positive impact on clinical outcome and quality of care. I think we all want that, irrespective of your role in the organization. I think the other piece is optimization of resources. And I think... Um, Apart from fiscal and personnel uh, resources, I think the other piece is also the bioethics. Uh, Dr. Pouch showed you how overexposure or prior exposure to something like datomycin might be associated with non-susceptible VRE, which has been quite detrimental to the transplant patients. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that we are using antibiotics in a way that is judicious so that we don't cause problems down the road. The other piece would be the metrics, whether it's cost related, whether it's length of stay, readmission, complications. We talked about how we could get that information um, and use that to support stewardship programs for transplant patients. I think it's important to justify any incremental investment that's needed to support the stewardship program for transplant patients and kind of explain what would be the gains, whether it's financial or quality of care. I think all of those things should be important to highlight. And so with that, that finishes the um, didactic part of the presentation, and uh, we'd be happy to answer questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patch and Dr. So, for putting together such a fantastic, informative presentation. Um, we're now going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions, but <clears throat> before I go ahead and turn it back to Betty, to facilitate the Q&A session, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you do have any questions for either of our presenters, please be sure to submit them using that chat feature. As a reminder, that's going to be located on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Additionally, during the Q&A session, I'm going to have this poll up. Um, so for those of you who are maybe participating in a group, if you could please just complete this poll and let us know how many people in your respective group are participating, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it back to Betty. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions in the queue right now, so I'll go ahead and ask one that I thought of. Um, for either of our speakers, what do you see as the major challenges and lessons learned for transplant programs trying to establish a stewardship program? Thanks, Betty. Um, this is Stephanie. I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, you know, I think on a, on a personal level or on a, you know, what I've experienced is that I think, you know, while um, we've hopefully shown that there is a lot of value in transplant-specific st stewardship programs, that we need to keep in mind that there isn't kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to stewardship um, within a transplant program. And so, 
you know, we've learned that our individual um, transplant teams, again, are very different with respect to culture. Um, so, you know, our liver team, for example, rounds and and uh, does things a lot differently than our lung team does, for example. And so I think um, one of the things that we've learned is that not only do we need to take, um, take stewardship into consideration, but actually tailor our stewardship interventions and, and how we work with the teams um, to those individual team dynamics. Miranda, any thoughts that you have? Um, I totally agree with um, Stephanie's comments, and that's actually been our experience um, in Toronto as well. Um, I think that graph that Stephanie put up, um, the paper by Sharani and colleagues, understanding the culture is extremely important. And believe it or not, there's actually microcultures within the different teams too. And so learning to work with them, be agile and flexible, it's actually going to go a long way. Um, don't hesitate to actually speak to the perhaps the specific team leader and, and try to understand what works for them. Because if it doesn't work for them, you know, they'll just vote with their feet and they're not going to engage with you. So I think that we mustn't lose sight of and it's, um, it's important to have dialogues. Yeah, and I, you know, the other thing too is that when we think about stewardship, we think about improvement and, and measures. And, you know, another thing that I, we, I think both Miranda and I have found to help is to be able to provide even program or, or organ-specific organ um, data to the program. So, you know, does, you know, our VRE rates different in our liver patients than they are in our lung patients? And so I think being able to provide um, center and program-specific um, data to the individual programs can really, um, can really help. Okay, thank you. Um, I still don't see any questions in the queue. So um, what help us understand the difference between infectious diseases teams and the stewardship team? I mean, they both deal with antibiotics. And um, what is the focus and, and um, the membership um, that differs between the two? So maybe I'll take a stab at this first. So I think, uh, yes, it is important to recognize that, you know, um, both transplant infectious diseases and antimicrobial stewardship team, we all deal with antibiotics and infections. I would say that the stewardship team kind of look at it from a programmatic way. So not just at the individual patient level, but at the kind of patient population level. In this case, it would be the patients on your transplant unit, um, or the specific liver uh, recipients, for example. So we look at it from a quality improvement and a kind of a high level uh, perspective. Whereas, you know, the infectious disease consultant, uh, valuable colleagues for stewardship programs, but they advise and consult on the individual patient. We work closely together, um, but we are not uh, doing the same thing. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think, um, and I think you know, it's really important to maintain those open and active dialogues between the stewardship team and, you know, the in this case, the transplant infectious disease team. And and um, I myself know that I actually have come, I really heavily rely on our on our stewardship. Um, on my stewardship colleagues at my institution. And so I think, um, you know, co ongoing conversations between the two sort of infectious disease focus teams um, is really helpful in, in looking at each individual patient. Okay. I think we're close to the top of the hour, so I'll turn it back to Deanna. All right. Thank you, Betty. Um, so it looks like that's going to conclude our Q&A discussion. So um, on behalf of the Alliance, I'd just like to once again thank Dr. Pouch and Phil for such a fantastic presentation. And additionally, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to Betty for her efforts in coordinating um, today's discussion. So thank you to the three of you ladies. And um, to our participants, we especially like to thank you for your continued participation in our educational initiatives, and we hope you all continue to stay safe, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Take care.